So my name is Shalini. I am an accredited representative at Diocesan Migrant and Refugee Services. Um, and my presentation today is to talk about some of the misconceptions about immigration and why people are undocumented in the United States. Like I said, I work for Diocesan Migrant and Refugee Services. We, are, we provide free and low-cost immigration legal services in West Texas and New Mexico. I'm an accredited representative, which means I'm not a lawyer, but I am eligible to represent people both in immigration court and before U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. Um, I've been working at DMRS for six and a half years, and I've been an accredited representative for five. So today's presentation is an educational presentation. It is not legal advice. Please don't take it as legal advice. As will hopefully become clear today, the immigration system is, is extremely complicated. Um, the title of today's presentation was taken from this infographic published by Reason Magazine in 2008. It is a, basically a short version of everything that I'm going to talk about in the presentation today. It explains how it is how hard it is, if not impossible it is, to get papers in, in the U.S. today. So, to get started, there are basically four groups of people in the immigration system. You have citizens who aren't in the immigration system. Um, citizens, for the most part, can't be deported, can't be detained. The only time immigration has authority over you as a U.S. citizen is when you're at a port of entry. You're at an airport, you're at an international bridge, and you're asking for permission to enter. And as long as you can convince immigration you are a U.S. citizen, they have to let you in. Then you have people who are residents, LPRs, lawful permanent residents, people with a green card, all the same thing. Residents have a long-term permission to be in the United States. Residency never expires. The card expires, but just like when your passport expires, it doesn't mean you're not a citizen. You just need a new passport. When your residency card expires, it doesn't mean you're not a resident. You just need a new card. Residents are still under the authority of immigration. If a resident does something wrong, if they are convicted of certain crimes, if they abandon their residency by living too long outside of the United States, the government's going to try and take away someone's residency. But as long as a resident doesn't do anything wrong, residents get to live here for the rest of their lives, are supposed to live here for the rest of their lives. Then you have people with a visa. Visas are short-term permission to be in the United States. How long that permission is depends on what kind of visa you have. So most tourist visas allow a visa holder to be in the United States for six months. Student visas allow visa holders to be in the United States for basically as long as they're in school. But visas are short term. Visas are not a, a forever permission to be in the United States. Visas expire and the visa holders are supposed to return to their home country. And then you have people who are undocumented. Maybe they entered with a visa. Visa expired, they overstayed, maybe they entered without a visa. But they're here, they don't have visas, they're not residents, they're not citizens, they basically have nothing. Today's presentation is going to focus on ways to become a citizen and ways to become a resident. We're not going to talk about short-term visas at all. So there are a couple of different ways to be or to become a citizen. First way, born in the United States, pretty simple. Another way to become a citizen is to naturalize. If you are already a lawful permanent resident, you already have a green card, and you have been a resident for three to five years, and you can read, write, and speak English, and you can pass a civics test, and you are a person of good moral character, which basically means you've never been convicted of any crimes, and you can pay $725 for the application, you can apply to be a citizen. Um, if the government agrees that yes, you have been a resident for the required amount of time, and yes, you can read, write, and speak English, and you pass the civics test, and the government agrees you are a person of good moral character, they will approve your application. You swear an oath of loyalty to the United States, and from that moment on, you are a U.S. citizen. Um, that citizenship never expires, it never has to be renewed in every single way except for one tiny little way. It is exactly the same as citizenship if you were born here. We'll talk about what that one tiny way is in just a second. The last way you can become a citizen is to inherit citizenship. Uh, if your parents or parents were citizens when you were born, you are sometimes also a U.S. citizen, even if you were born in a different country. This is mostly used by people who are in the military or people who are diplomats, because if I'm serving overseas it's not, and I have a child, it's not very fair for that child to be anything but a citizen. Um, it's been in the news 
recently because Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz was born in Canada, and he was running for president. And the, the Constitution says something very specific about who is eligible to be president as relates to citizenship. In order to be president, you have to be a natural-born citizen. And we've never decided what natural-born citizen means. Most legal scholars think natural-born citizens means citizen when you were born. Ted Cruz was a citizen when he was born because his mom was a citizen when he was born. Um, he has a Canadian birth certificate, but all his mom had to do was write to the American consulate in Canada, and she would have gotten back a certificate of citizen born abroad. And that certificate does not say Ted Cruz became a citizen when he was five and his mom applied for the certificate. It says Ted Cruz is a US citizen who was born outside of the United States. Some legal scholars think natural born citizen means born in the United States. And I'm sure if and when Ted Cruz runs for president again, we'll figure it out. But it's extra fun because of the birther movement. Everyone's heard the idea that President Obama was not eligible to be president because he was born in Kenya. Let's say he were born in Kenya. His mom was a citizen when he was born. His mom spent the required amount of time in the United States before he was born. So even if Obama were born in Kenya, he would also have inherited citizenship at birth. So basically, if Ted Cruz is eligible to be president, it does not matter where Obama was born. And if it matters where Obama was born, Ted Cruz is not eligible to be president, which I think is pretty fun. And that is the only difference between a born citizen or someone who inherits citizenship and a naturalized citizen. Someone who is first a resident and then becomes a citizen cannot be president. They were not citizens at the time of their birth. Arnold Schwarzenegger talks every once in a while about running for president. He would require a constitutional amendment because he was not a citizen when he was born. So let's talk about ways to become a resident. The first way is employment-based um, and millionaire-based. If you have a million dollars and you are willing to invest a million dollars in the United States, and through that investment you can create 10 jobs, you can get residency that way. That number is $500,000 if you're willing to invest in an economically depressed area. If you are outstanding in your field, the top 1% in your field in the world, you can get residency through the uh, outstanding process. On the infographic that I showed a couple of slides ago, there was a little part about David Beckham, which is blown up here. If you are as good at your job as David Beckham is at soccer, you can get residency through the outstanding process. If you are not as good at your job as David Beckham is at soccer, this is not for you. One other way to get residency through an employer, your employer can petition for you. In order for that petition to be accepted, your employer has to prove that there are no citizens or residents who are able or willing to do your job. We ex allow 140,000 people to get residency through this employment-based petition every year. 130,000 of those residencies are reserved for people with advanced degrees. Doctors, lawyers, computer scientists, um, people with master's degrees or higher. 10,000 of, th of these residencies are reserved for people without advanced degrees. Um, the problem with this process, which is a problem that we're going to talk about more during the presentation, you cannot get residency through your employer if you are undocumented here in the United States. That is not for your neighbor who has been landscaping your yard for the last 15 years and is the best landscaper you've ever met and you want to do everything you can to help him. That person is here in the United States undocumented. He cannot get residency through an employer petition. The most common, well-known way to get residency is through a family petition. Everyone's heard about uh, residency through spouses. There are four citizens who can file a petition for me so that I can become a resident. My citizen spouse, my citizen parent, my citizen child, as long as that child is 21 or over, and my citizen sibling. There are two residents who can file a petition for me, my citizen parent and my citizen spouse, which sounds like a lot, and sounds super easy and is not. If the person petitioning for me is my citizen spouse, my citizen parent, and I am unmarried and under 21, or is my citizen child, 21 or over, that process is considered an immediate relative petition and the process takes only as long as it takes for the government to read and decide that petition, six months to two years. Everyone else has to wait. 
how long they have to wait is determined by this visa bulletin. This visa bulletin is published by the State Department every month, and you have right here April 2017. So let's say that I'm a resident, I'm an LPR, I'm a lawful permanent resident, and I'm petitioning for my spouse. Petitioner, LPR, spouse, beneficiary, spouse, category F2A. And let's say that we're from Mexico. Right now, they're working on petitions that were filed May 22, 2015, so it's about a two-year wait long. Let's look at a different case. Let's say that I'm a citizen, I'm a USC, I'm a United States citizen, and I'm petitioning for my 22-year-old who is unmarried. Petitioner, USC parent, beneficiary, unmarried child over 21, category F1. And once again, we are from Mexico. Right now, they're working on petitions that were filed on May 22nd of 1995. One of the things that we hear when we talk about immigration reform, and especially when we talk about undocumented immigrants in this country, is why don't people just come over legally? This is one of the reasons why people can't just come over legally, because coming over legally forces family separation. Coming over legally means the petitioner, citizen or resident, is living in the United States. And the beneficiary, who is not a citizen or a resident, and we want to come over legally, is living outside of the United States. There is no in the meantime visa, there is no while you're waiting work permit. Coming over legally means families are separated. Let's say that I'm a citizen and I petitioned for my 25-year-old. I petitioned for her three years ago and they're still not working on that petition and she wants to come visit me. For the most part, she has to go to the American consulate in her home country. And on that application for a visa, the application asks, who do you know in the United States? Do you have relatives in the United States? Do you have relatives who are citizens or residents? And when she tells the truth and says, yes, the consular official is going to say, you know what, we think that if you, we give you a visa, you're going to overstay because your mom lives in the United States. To avoid you overstaying your visa, violating the terms of your visa, you can't even go visit. Coming over legally means families are separate. This is not just a lack of resources. This is not just that the government can't read and decide all of the petitions that were filed. The government decided in 1997 that 480,000 people can get residency through this process every year. They decided that young children of citizens, parents of citizens, spouses of citizens get priority. So the process takes only as long as it takes for the government to read and decide that petition, six months to two years. Everyone else has to wait. The government decided that spouses of residents, young children of residents get priority over older children of citizens and residents. Everyone gets priority over siblings. India, China, Mexico, and the Philippines are on here because people from those countries are petitioning for their family members in disproportionately high numbers. Instead of having them get residency in disproportionately high numbers, they have to wait extra. Every country in the world is all on here. All of the other countries are just looking at all chartability areas except those listed. Like I said, this is published by the State Department every month, and you have for comparison two months, April and May. Doesn't go up by a month every month. Sometimes it stays the same, sometimes it goes backwards. So according to this person's calculations, let's say that I'm a resident and I'm petitioning for my 22-year-old and we are in the F2B category. And let's say that we are from Kenya, anywhere other than China, India, Mexico, or the Philippines. File the petition today. They are currently working on petitions that were filed on September 15th of 2010, so about six and a half years ago. According to this person's calculations, it would actually take about nine and a half years, so one and a half times what you would expect. Same case, but we are from Mexico. I'm a resident, I'm petitioning for my 22-year-old, and we are from Mexico. Right now, they're working on petitions that were filed on December 22nd, 1995. File the petition today. According to this person's calculations, the government will likely start working on my petition in 115 years. And if I, as the petitioner, die in the next 115 years, and I'm going to die in the next 115 years, that petition is automatically terminated. Why don't people just come over legally? This is why. Another thing that we hear is people have to wait in line. We can't have an immigration reform. We can't have an amnesty because then we would be rewarding people who broke the law. If they wanted papers, they should have waited in line. There is a line. If it's a line that takes 115 years, it's not a line we can reasonably expect people to wait in. Mexican siblings, 164 years. Mexican older children, between 60 and 85 years. 
So that's problem number one with the family visa system. Problem number two with the family visa system. It's very expensive and you need to be making a fair amount of money. First part of the petition, proving that I am a citizen and my spouse is my spouse and we have a good faith marriage and we didn't just get married for papers, is $535. Second part of the petition, proving that my spouse is eligible for residency, doesn't have a criminal history, doesn't have an immigration history, isn't secretly a Nazi or a terrorist or a communist, is $1,225 a person. It is my husband and his two children, that's $3,600. Each of them needs a medical exam, which is $150 to $250. Attorney's fees are easily $5,000 to $10,000. We at DMRS provide free legal services when we can, and when we can't, we charge 5 to 10% of what a private attorney charges, which is still $1,200. All of which gets paid before the government even starts to look at that petition. If they decide that my husband is not eligible for residency, they will not give him his money back. And I, as the petitioner, need to be making a fair amount of money. I need to be making 125% of poverty. Now, the federal government defines poverty every year, and they define it by family size. They say if you have a family of three and you're making X amount of money a year, you are at poverty, above poverty, below poverty, poverty. And every assistance, service, benefit you can think of uses this same system. Some people use double the poverty line, 200% of poverty. Some people use half the poverty line, 50% of poverty. Immigration uses 125% of poverty. They say that if I want my husband to become a resident, I as the petitioner need to be making 125% of poverty. The point of this is to ensure that I can support him. If he becomes a resident, he won't immediately start asking for benefits because I have proven that I can support him. Which, let's make that very clear, new residents do not qualify for federal benefits within the first five to 10 or more years of being residents. Not food stamps, not cash assistance, not social security benefits, not Medicaid, they do not qualify. People who are undocumented do not qualify for benefits. Not Obamacare, not food stamps, no federal benefits. But, going back to me and my poor fictional husband. Let's say I have a child and my husband has two children. For immigration purposes, we're a family of five, the two of us and the three of them. 125% of poverty for a family of five is $36,000. Now let's say that I'm working full time and I'm making minimum wage, which in Texas is $7.25 an hour. $7.25 an hour working full time is $15,000. It is nowhere near $36,000. It is nowhere near 125% of poverty. If I do not make 125% of poverty, my husband cannot become a resident. Let's say we don't have any kids, it's just me and him, we have a family of two. 125% of poverty for a family of two is $20,000. I still don't make enough. And if I don't make 125% of poverty, my husband cannot become a resident. We can try and get a sponsor, someone else who is a citizen or a resident who is making above 125% of poverty, who's willing to sign basically a financial guarantee. The problem is we live in an extremely segregated society. If I'm making 15,000, I don't know anybody who's making 36,000. And if I know someone who's making 36,000, they probably already sponsored four people. And they made enough for a family of five, them and the four people they already sponsored. They don't make enough for a family of six. They can't sponsor my husband as well. So that's problem number two with the family visa system. Problem number three with the family visa system. I'm sure everyone has heard the term anchor bee. Anchor babies refer to children who are born in the United States to undocumented mo mothers. And the myth is that now that mothers have citizen kids, they can't be deported. These kids are their anchors. Well, we talked about how old my child has to be in order to petition for me. My child has to be 21 years old in order to petition for me. If I'm undocumented and I get picked up and my child is 15, it's not going to help me because my child can't petition for me. We're going to talk about all of the ways to get residency in the United States. If I get picked up and I don't qualify for any of those ways, it doesn't matter if I have 15 kids who are citizens, I'm going to get deported. But let's say I make it. I make it 21 years staying under the radar trying not to get picked up. And on my child's 21st birthday, she files a petition for me. And we pay the 535 and the application for residency and the medical exam and the attorney's fees. 
And if I originally enter the country without a visa, without permission, I cannot get residency in the United States. I have to do the process through the American consulate in my home country. And if I'm Mexican and living in El Paso, it's a little bit easier because the consulate's in Juarez, but most of the world is not Mexican and living in El Paso. So I have to go across the world to the country I haven't been to for 21 years. And at that interview, after I've paid all of the application fees, the consular official will say, your petition is denied because of your unlawful presence. Because you have spent more than six months or more than a year in the United States undocumented, and then you left. If I've been here for six months to a year undocumented and then I leave for any reason to go to the interview at the American consulate because that's what the law says I have to do, I cannot come back for three years. If I've been here undocumented a year or more and then I leave, I cannot come back for 10 years. So when we're talking about anchor babies, what we're actually talking about is 21 years here undocumented and then 10 years outside of the country before I can even start to talk about residency. And someone once asked when I, was, when I was giving this presentation, well, that mom could just sneak back in, and they'll be just as undocumented as they were before, and they haven't lost anything, which is true if you could make it back in. Five years ago, 10 years ago, crossing the border undocumented was a little bit easier. We talk about securing our borders. Our borders are unbelievably secure. You cross today, you are going to get caught. And like I mentioned, if you get caught, it does not matter that you have 15 kids who are citizens. It does not matter that you were only outside of the country for two weeks because your attorney, who didn't care that you would be denied, just wanted you to pay him to do the work, didn't tell you that you wouldn't be allowed back in. All that matters is that you have been picked up, immigration has caught you, knows that you're here, knows that you're undocumented, you are going to get deported. And if I do manage to sneak back in, I've triggered a permanent bar for having been here for a year undocumented, having left, and having re-entered without undocumented. I can basically never get residency in the United States. So, let's talk about ways you can stay here based on the amount of time that you've been here. The first one is DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. DACA was created through executive order in the summer of 2012. In 2012, when immigration reform didn't pass again, President Obama took matters into his own hands. A president on his own cannot create a path to residency or a path to citizenship. That requires an act of Congress. What a president can do is prioritize people for deportation. We have 11 million, 14 million, however many million undocumented immigrants in the United States. We are spending billions of dollars deporting them. We could spend trillions and we would never get every single one. So if we can't get everybody, we should prioritize, and that's what Obama did. What he did was deprioritize a group of people for deportation. He said, if you fulfill these requirements, you don't have a criminal history. You entered the United States when you were a child, before you were 16. You are currently in high school or have already graduated high school. You have been here for the last five years. You are officially low priority for deportation. You can submit an application to immigration pay the application fee, which is now $495, with proof that you fulfill all of these requirements. And if the government agrees that yes, you fulfill these requirements, you get back a letter that says you have deferred action. You are not a resident, you are not a citizen, you have deferred action. If you were to be stopped by immigration, any deportation against you should be deferred. Any action against you should be deferred, deferred action. That doesn't mean that you're never going to get deported. It means that first we're going to deport the criminals and the terrorists and the recent border crossers and the Nazis. And then once we've deported all of those people, then we can talk about what we're going to do with you. Until that point, your deportation is deferred, deferred action. With that letter, you get a work permit. With, those two, with the work permit, you get a social security number. With those two things, you get a driver's license. You can pass the immigration checkpoints. You can stop working under the table. You can go to college. You can do all of these things that you couldn't do before, even though you are, for all intents and purposes, American. This program was created through executive order. Obama created it. President Trump can get rid of it. And he promised before the election he would get rid of it on his first day in office. After the election, he hasn't said much of anything. 
It is a very scary time to be undocumented in general. It is an extra scary time to have DACA. Because these are kids, young adults, they were born after 1981, who are often the only people in their household with work permits, who are often the only, the person who is paying the household bills for the entire family because they are the only person who are allowed to work not under the table. And they can't plan for the future. They don't know what's going to happen a week from now because President Trump could decide to get rid of this program. Another way you can stay here based on the amount of time that you've been here is registry. If you've been here continuously since 1972 and you are a person of good moral character, which once again basically means you've never committed any crimes and you've never been deported, you can try and get re residency through registry. Next year will not be 1973, it's been 1972 since 1985. If you have been picked up, ICE has caught you and told you to see an immigration judge, and the judge is deciding if you have to leave the country or you can stay. And you fulfill these three requirements, you can try and get residency through this process. Requirement number one, you have lived in the U.S. for 10 years. Proving that you've been here for two weeks when you're undocumented is fairly difficult because nothing is in your name, because you're trying not to exist. The rental contract is in somebody else's name. The utilities are in somebody else's name because the utility companies won't put them in your name because you don't have a social security number. You don't have a bank account because you don't have a photo, photo ID. Maybe you haven't paid your taxes. You have been working for the same employer for the last 20 years. He pays you cash under the table every Friday. You don't have check stubs. You don't exist. And now you've been picked up and asked to see an immigration judge. And you've been here for 20 years, but you can't prove it. If you can't prove it, you can't get tenure cancellation or removal. It's a problem for DACA, it's a problem for registry, it's a problem for tenure cancellation of removal. The government will never accept just testimony as proof of presence. You need proof. But let's say that I have proof. I have a 15-year-old who was born in the United States. My child's birth certificate, medical records, school records all exist, and the judge agrees, yeah, if my minor child was in the United States, I was too. Requirement number two, you are a person of good moral character. Once again, basically means you've never committed any crimes. Basically, anything other than a traffic ticket is going to make you ineligible. It does not matter that I, my only charge is for shoplifting when I was 18 because we're all kind of dumb when we're 18 and I was with my friends and we decided this was a good idea. And now I'm 30 and I have three kids and I haven't shoplifted since then and I've clearly changed. The law says the charge makes me ineligible, it makes me ineligible. The judge cannot look at me and say, well, I see that you've changed. I see that you deserve another chance. The law defines what makes me ineligible. This makes me ineligible. I cannot get tenure cancellation of removal. But let's say I've never been convicted of any crimes. Requirement number three, you have a parent, spouse, or child who is a citizen or a resident who would suffer exceptional and extremely unusual hardship if I were to be deported. That is not that I'm a single mom, I have three kids, they're all citizens. If I were to be deported, I would need to take them with me because I'm a single mom. There's no one here who could take care of me. They don't really speak Spanish. Mexico's really violent. I don't know anyone in Mexico anymore. I don't know how they would go to school because they don't speak Spanish, so I can't put them in public school. And I can't put them in private school because I don't have the money to pay for private school. That's normal suffering. The normal suffering that occurs when a parent is deported. Exceptional and extremely unusual hardship. That is normally medical conditions. Let's say I have a child who is a citizen who has cancer. Once again, I'm a single mom. If I were to be deported, I would need to take my child with me because there's no one here who could take care of her. Medical treatment doesn't exist to the same level in my home country. My child would die. Exceptional and extremely unusual hardship. There are 400,000 people in removal proceedings every year. The government is allowed to grant 4,000 of these, and they just barely hit that 4,000 number. Because proving exceptional and extremely unusual hardship is so unbelievably difficult. And those are all of the ways that you can get papers based on the amount of time that you've been here. U visa is a way to get residency if you've been a victim of a crime. In order to get a U visa, you have to have call the police or law enforcement there needs to be a law enforcement report with your name on it as a victim, and you have to have cooperated with the police in their investigation. 
Well, let's talk through some examples. Let's say that I'm a survivor of domestic violence, and I call the police when the abuse is occurring. And two weeks later, the police come back and say, do you want to press charges? We're ready for your testimony. And I say, he is a good person. He just made a mistake. I know he's going to change. Also, he works and I don't because I take care of the kids. If he doesn't get out of jail, the kids and I are going to be homeless. No, I don't want to press charges. I want to give him another chance. With that, the police are going to say that I was not cooperative in their investigation and they will not certify me for a U visa. In order to get a U visa, one of the papers I have to submit to immigration is a signature page signed by law enforcement saying I was helpful in their investigation. Let's say it's not domestic violence. I was assaulted in the street and it's gang related. And I know that if I testify, something's gonna happen to my kids and so I'm too scared to testify. The police are gonna say that I was not helpful in their investigation and they will not certify me for a U visa. I am happy to testify, but testifying requires going into the courthouse and at the courthouse door, the guards ask me for my photo ID. And I'm too scared to tell them why I don't have a photo ID because last month a lady was picked up by ICE at the courthouse when she was testifying against her abuser. And so I'm too scared to tell them why I don't have a photo ID, I just leave. The police are going to say I did not testify and will not, I did not cooperate in their investigation and will not certify me for a U visa. I have to have called the police. Now let's take a short tangent and come back. The Bush administration created a program called Secure Communities, and under Secure Communities, the police have to share information with immigration. The point of this program was to ensure that our dangerous, violent, scary criminals, after serving their long jail sentences, were picked up by ICE and deported, which the deportation of gang members from California to Central America is the reason that those gangs exist today, but sure, this is a good idea. The point of this program was to pick up our dangerous, scary, violent criminals. But what happens is if you are in jail for any reason, you are caught in this net and sent to ICE. I am in jail because of mistaken identity, because I thought I was someone else. I am in jail because I was accused of a crime, but I was found not guilty. I am in jail because I have unpaid traffic tickets. I am in jail because I called the police when abuse was occurring. And when the police showed up, my husband says that I was abusive, and the police didn't know who to believe, so they picked us both up. And within a few hours, it was very clear that I have never abused anyone, but now I'm in jail, and I have an ice hold. Now that the police are done with me, they have to keep me for 48 to 72 hours until ICE has a chance to come to the jail, figure out who I am, figure out that I'm undocumented, and tell me, place me in removal proceedings so that I can be deported. The police should not be enforcing immigration laws because if the police enforce immigration laws, immigrant communities do not trust the police. Being undocumented is not a crime. It is a violation of immigration laws. We have a lot of sets of laws in this country. We have bankruptcy laws, we have family laws, we have te landlord tenant laws, we have immigration laws, we have criminal laws. And the only laws you can be sent to jail for violating are the criminal laws. A good analogy is if I don't pay my rent. If I don't pay my rent, it is a violation of landlord-tenant laws. I cannot go to jail. There are consequences. I will get evicted, but I cannot go to jail because not paying my rent is not a crime. It is a violation of administrative laws. In the same way, being here undocumented is a violation of immigration laws. It, it is a violation of administrative laws. It is not a crime. Entering the United States undocumented, entering the United States through the river or over the wall is a crime. It is the federal crime of illegal entry. I am only going to get sent to jail for the crime of illegal entry if I was actually caught crossing. If nobody actually caught me crossing over the wall, they don't have enough proof to convict me of illegal entry. If I'm caught in the United States, they cannot prove that I entered illegally and will find it very hard to convict me for the crime of illegal entry. Beyond that, the majority of undocumented immigrants in the United States did not enter illegally, they entered with a visa. They entered perfectly legally, through an international port of entry, 
at an airport or at an international bridge, which means that if I'm here undocumented, it is extremely likely that I have never committed any crimes, not e even illegal entry. Being here undocumented is not a crime. And there is a reason why the police should enforce only criminal laws and not immigration laws. The police should not be asking about immigration status because they cannot send me to jail if I am undocumented. And the police should not be asking about immigration status because if the police ask about immigration status, immigrant communities do not trust the police, which is a problem for security in our communities in general and is a problem for a U visa. Because in order to get a U visa, you have to have called the police. Asylum is the only protection for people who are scared to return to their home country. In order to win asylum, I need to prove a lot of things. I need to prove that there is persecution. I need to prove who is looking for me. I need to prove why they are looking for me. I need to prove that my government cannot or is unwilling to help me. I need to prove that it does not matter where I go in, the home, in my home country, the same people will look for me and can find me. And I need to prove that I am being looked for for one of the five reasons listed here. Let's start with the first one, persecution. That is not general violence. That is not that it is 2008 and I live in Juarez, which is the most dangerous city in the world with eight murders a day. And I'd like to not live in Juarez where there are eight murders a day. I'd like to live in El Paso where there are two murders a year. And there are no decapitated heads on my street. General violence is not persecution. If I cannot prove that somebody is actively looking for me, I cannot win asylum. I have to prove who is looking for me, and I have to prove my own identity. Now, asking for asylum is somewhat simple. Winning asylum, not simple. Asking for asylum, somewhat simple. I need to be physically in the United States, and I need to let an immigration officer know that I'm scared, I would like protection, I would like to ask for asylum. I can do that at a port of entry. I can do that at the bridge. And so you had people literally running away from danger. There was someone at the front door. I ran out the back door and I ran to the bridge. There was someone shooting at my car. I drove my car to the bridge. And I, as I drove to the bridge, I did not stop to pick up my birth certificate or my passport. And now I cannot prove that I am the person that I say that I am. And I didn't stop to pick up the notarized letter that the Juarez cartel totally left for me saying, we are the Juarez cartel. We are going to kill you because, have a great day, I just left. And I know that it's the Juarez cartel because everybody knows that it's the Juarez cartel. I know that it's the Juarez cartel because word on the street is that it's the Juarez cartel. But the fact that I know is not enough to prove to a judge. And if I cannot prove who is looking for me, I cannot win asylum. I have to prove that my government cannot or is unwilling to help me. Now it is very clear that the Mexican and Central American governments are unable, unwilling to control the gangs and the cartels. A mix of both, but they're not being controlled. That is not enough. The judges want police reports. Well, nobody has police reports because the police are corrupt. Nobody has police reports because the best thing that happens to you when you file a police report is the police say, go home. We can't help you, we can't protect you, and if we, they find out you are here, you will get killed. The worst thing that happens to you when you file a police report is the police take the report, and the next day the men with guns, guns come back to your house and say, we told you not to go to the authority. And so for that reason, nobody has police reports. But the judges say, how did you expect your government to help you if you do not file a report? You have to prove that it does not matter where you go in your home country, the same people will look for you and can find you. Now it is very clear that the gangs and the cartels have reach from Honduras to Juarez. That is not enough. Apparently what the judges want is for me to get threatened in Juarez and not come to El Paso and ask for asylum, but move to Mexico City and get threatened but not killed in Mexico City. And then move to Cancun and get threatened but not killed in Cancun. And then move to El Paso and ask for asylum. If I cannot prove that the same people will look for me and can find me no matter where I go, I cannot win asylum. I have to prove that I am being looked for for one of the five reasons we're listed here. My race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or because I belong to a certain social group. This system was created during the Cold War, and it worked really well during the Cold War, when it was governmental persecution, and it was because people were dissidents or people were religious, or people were part of ethnic groups. 
it does not work so well in Mexico and Central America where it's not Mexican governmental persecution. And it's not because of race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. So all you have left is social group, defined as a part of your identity that you cannot change or should not have to change. So let's talk about some asylum cases. Let's say that I own a restaurant. I'm from Juarez, I own a restaurant. Some people showed up at my restaurant and said, you have to pay us the protection fee, you have to pay us the quota, you have to pay us X number of pesos a month, or we're gonna kill you. In Central America, they call it the rent, because everybody has to pay it. And I paid for a few months, and then they came back and said, you have to pay us more. And I don't have more, so now I'm asking for asylum. The fact that I own a restaurant is not my race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. It is not a part of my identity that I cannot change or should not have to change. It is not my social group. It is not any of these five reasons, so I cannot win asylum. I'm a police officer. I'm not corrupt. I did my job. I arrested Chapo, and now they're going to kill me. The judges agree. You cannot change history. I cannot change the fact that I was a police officer. It is an immutable part of my identity. But the judges, judges across the country say, you knew the risks of becoming a police officer before you became one. You cannot choose a dangerous profession and ask the US government for protection. You cannot win asylum. I am a 15-year-old male from El Salvador. The gang said, join us or we'll kill you. So I moved. And the gang over there said, join us or we'll kill you. So now I'm in the United States asking for asylum. I cannot change the fact that I'm 15, I cannot change the fact that I'm male, and I should not have to join the gang. Courts across the country have said that that is not a valid social group. The reason is that it is not a defined group of people, it is everybody. This is happening to every male between the ages of 15 and 40. Everybody is not a group of people, it is everybody. It is therefore by definition not a social group, and I cannot win asylum. And it is very clearly the floodgates arguments. We let in one 15-year-old male who doesn't want to join the gang, we have to let them all in. We don't want to let them all in, so we're not going to let in the one. This document is published by the Department of Justice every year, and it talks about who is winning asylum by country. It's basically a list of the U.S. government's enemies. Russia, China, Egypt, the people we don't like. And there's a really amazing country on here, a country that maybe hasn't existed for about tw 20 years. Soviet Union. Soviet Union, Soviet Union, Soviet Union. Who is winning asylum? Apparently people from the Soviet Union. I tried to look up who these Soviets were and came up with nothing. The only thing I can think of is that they are people who started their asylum case 20 years ago and finally won last year. Which, if you're not detained, asylum can take three, five, maybe seven, maybe 10 years. It does not take 20 years. And I'm not saying that these Soviets, whoever they are, do not deserve asylum. I am saying that it is ludicrous that in fiscal year 2014, more people from the Soviet Union, the country that has not existed for 20 years, won asylum than people from Mexico or Honduras. Like I said, it's basically a list of our enemies. It is much easier to win asylum if you're from a country that the US government doesn't like. China's number one. China is consistently number one. Over 20% of asylum grants go to people from China. And the reason is the US government publishes lots of reports every year talking about how much China violates human rights because it is in our economic and political interest to do so. And so if I'm asking for asylum and I'm, ask, I'm from China, the prosecutor, the trial attorney, doesn't have much of a leg to stand on. There are no reports that say China doesn't violate human rights. And I'm not saying that they don't violate human rights. They definitely do. If I'm from El Salvador, the US government gives El Salvador billions of dollars on the war on drugs. We cannot give them billions of dollars and then write truthful reports about the state of human rights in, their, in that country. Because if we do so, we would be admitting that we're basically propping up a failed government. And so our reports don't tell the truth. The US government reports talk about how much things are changing. There used to not be due process, but there's much more due process now, and the courts are definitely transparent. There used to be torture and extrajudicial killings in the jails, but definitely not anymore. And so if I'm Salvadorian and I'm asking for asylum, the prosecutor, the trial attorney, stands up and cites all of these reports and says, it's not as bad as you think it is. Just go home. It is also the floodgates argument. 
Oddly enough, there are a lot of similarities between Somali asylum and Salvadorian asylum. There is a government that isn't really in charge. The gang in El Salvador says, join us or we'll kill you. The militia in Somalia says, join us or we'll kill you. But a case that is horrendously weak from El Salvador, and no attorney would ever accept for representation because it is an extremely poor use of our unbelievably limited resources, it's kind of a decent Somali case. Because if I'm a judge and I have 100 Salvadorians on my docket, 100 Salvadorians whose asylum cases are coming up over the next couple of months, and their cases are bad, and I have no doubt that they're going to be in danger if they were to be returned to El Salvador, but there's 100 of them, I can't give all 100 of them asylum. That would just be opening up the floodgates. To avoid opening the floodgates, I'm going to deny them all asylum. If I have six Somalis on my docket, and their case is no better or no worse than the Salvadorians, but there's only six of them, I can give six of them asylum without opening up the floodgates. And for that reason, case law and precedent, if you are from Mexico and Central America, is so much stricter, and it's so much harder to win asylum. This is another document published by the courts, and it talks about grant rates. El Paso, the El Paso Detention Center, the El Paso Special Processing Center, in fiscal year 2016, granted 2% of asylum cases. Then you look at New York, and the judges in New York granted 85% of asylum cases. And that has a little bit to do with how the courts are set up. Even though immigration law is federal and it's supposed to be the same in the whole country, courts are divided up into geographic circuits. Case law is a little bit different in each circuit. Texas is in the most conservative circuit, and we have the most conservative judges. And it also has to do with who is asking for asylum. Around here, we get Mexicans and Central Americans. There are a couple of pockets of people from other countries, but it's mostly Mexicans and Central Americans. In New York, they get everybody. And we just talked about why it's not as hard to win if you're not from Mexico or Central America. So let's talk about refugees. Refugees are people who have fought their entire fear-based claim. They have fought, they have proven all of the things that I just mentioned. There is persecution, who is persecuting them, why they are being persecuted, that it is for one of these five reasons. They have fought their whole case from outside of the United States. They have left their home country, they're in a second country, and they've proven their case to the UN High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR. They usually spend a year and a half to three and a half years proving their case. And the UNHCR has talked to them and their spouse and their neighbors and asked for proof. And when they don't have proof because they fled their country, the UNHCR is going to find them not credible and not going to grant them refugee status. After looking at all of my proof, the UNHCR will determine that if I am a refugee for immigration purposes. Not everybody in a refugee camp is a refugee for immigration purposes. Once the UNHCR has designated me as a refugee, which less than 1% of people who apply for refugee status are granted refugee status, then the UNHCR starts to talk about where they're going to send me. Of these legally designated refugees, the US currently accepts 50,000 a year. It used to be 70,000, and then it went up to 112,000, and now it's 50,000. If I would like to resettle in the United States as a refugee, the U.S. government then starts investigating me. That process takes an additional year and a half to two and a half years. The CIA, the FBI, probably NSA, everybody has investigated me and has agreed, yes, I'm not secretly a terrorist. I also need to know someone in the United States who is able to sponsor me, personally vouch for me. At that point, I can enter the United States as a refugee. Again, we have 50,000 a year. The US government knows who those refugees are, has put them on planes. On this side, there's someone like DMRS, a refugee resettlement agency, at the airport, ready to pick them up. We take them to the housing that we've set up. Refugees are eligible for federal benefits for eight months, food stamps and cash assistance. Apparently, we believe that by month eight, they speak enough English to get a job. They are immediately eligible for a work permit, and after a year, they can become residents. The last way to get papers is the lottery, the Diversity Immigrant Visa Program. If you are from a country that historically doesn't send a lot of immigrants to the United States, 
Right now, there's a list of 14 countries who send too many immigrants to the United States and are not eligible to enter the lottery. If you are from a different country, you can apply for the lottery. You need to have graduated high school or have the equivalent work experience. 50,000 people are allowed to get residency through this lottery every year. 14 million people apply. And those are all of the ways that you can get papers in the United States. So again, the title of this presentation is What Part of Legal Immigration Don't You Understand? Everything that I talked about today has minute exceptions. The problem with the exceptions is that they are not merit-based. You do not qualify for an exception because you are a good person and you've been here for 15 years and you have 15 kids who are citizens. There are exceptions because it is, it is the law and there are tiny, minute loopholes. For example, you could get residency without having to go through the American consulate if you happen to have a petition that were filed in your name before 2001. Once again, not just because you're a good person, not just because your kids need you, but if you happen to have a petition that were filed over 16 years ago. There are misconceptions that people don't have papers because they just haven't gotten their act together and filed yet. People don't have papers because they're criminals. We barely talked about criminal history today. If you have a criminal history, you're not eligible for the majority of things that I mentioned. People don't have papers not because they're criminals, not because they're bad people, but because there's no way for the vast majority to get papers. Whether they're patiently waiting in line outside of the United States or whether they're here undocumented. I don't expect you to remember half of what I said. I said a lot today, and clearly the system is extremely complicated. But if you remember nothing else, remember that our system is broken. And remember that there is no way for even the good immigrants to legally stay here.